if you want uh, democratic political forces in general and, and liberal political forces in particular to play a significant role in uh, the development of a sustainable uh, political democracy, uh, it is absolutely, in my view at least, it is indispensable to pay attention to the development of political parties. And it may sound strange for a liberal to be heard saying that this is very much uh, uh, a matter of setting up structures, of seeing to it that the party in singular or the parties in the plural are present all over the country. Uh, eventually with very small structures, but at least that there is this presence. And because that is going to uh, ensure a degree of sustainability, uh, then you have an, an interlocutor, you have a small structure that is, should be able to select candidates uh, for elections, uh, and, and you have a transmission belt from uh, the basis up to the top and, and all, all the way back. And in these days of uh, social media, television, uh, we tend to overlook the importance of this. And we tend to believe that uh, in order to be successful, it's important to be on TV. Of course, it's important to be on TV, but I'm afraid that it's not sufficient, and certainly not in the long term. And uh, another element is that very often, uh, liberal-oriented political groups are more strongly represented in urban areas, in the area of the capital cities, but are much less present in the rural areas and, and in smaller towns and, and, and cities. And even if uh, at the time, I, I speak about 2008, uh, I was not especially spe familiar with the situation in, in, in Egypt, for instance, at least I knew that the Muslim bro Brotherhood, in, in various forms, had been active for decades, uh, either more or less publicly or else uh, um, clandestinely, but at least they had been active and working. So it was obvious that uh, new, newer parties, uh, more liberal-oriented parties, would have to start from a, a much less, uh, with much less potential for, for development. Uh, the same, by the way, is, is true for Tunisia, where you had, of course, the dominant party of the then president who was ousted. You had a few parties that in French we would call compagnons de route, uh, officially tolerated opposition parties with one or two members in the Tunisian parliament, but absolutely insignificant and therefore despised by the public because they had been seen to be going along with uh, the presidential regime for, for many years. Uh, in Morocco, the situation is, is different. There you do have uh, political parties, but very often the leaders are reluctant uh, to start doing the, the footwork that is indispensable if you want to, be, to build, to lay the foundation and then to, to, to further develop uh, an electoral base that is sustainable. So I'm afraid that my main message to, to you is that if you want liberal forces to develop in a sustainable way, in your various societies, it will be indispensable to start working, setting up and building structures. Now, 
a mistake often made, and this is going to be my, my final remark. No, I'll make two, I think. Uh, a mistake often made is that to believe that in order to set up a political organization, you need a lot of money, you need four-wheel drive, uh, you need officers, and that unless you have all that, you can't even start. Uh, that's also a, a widespread belief uh, in, in the rest of Africa, by the way. Now, that's not correct. Uh, in a way, many decades ago, when, when me, my husband, and a few others set up a local branch here in Brussels, capital of city of, of Belgium, uh, we started out of our kitchen, so to say. And of course we did not have, well, we had a small car, uh, but we didn't have offices that, that came later. What you need is a handful of people willing to start doing the work. And even if in highly developed societies, even in this era of social media, footwork is still indispensable. Show yourself See, look around, make sure that you are being seen. It is absolutely fundamental. Another element people have to learn when setting up political parties is that it is not necessary to agree on everything in order to be able to work together to build a political structure. Because if that is your point of departure, then create a, a, a one-man or a one-woman party and hope that you will always agree with yourself, uh, which is not necessarily going to be the case, learn that you need to agree on the fundamentals, but not on every single little detail. Uh, and this the belief, initial belief, explains why in soci newly democratic societies or societies who are developing towards democracy, the first stage is always a multiplication of parties. It's been the case in Eastern and uh, Central Europe. Uh, there's no reason why it should not be the case uh, in countries on the other shore of the Mediterranean. But that is just a phase. And you need to assemble people. So my message would be, uh, in order for liberals to gain influence, to be able to participate in modeling their societies start working, building political, liberal political parties. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, the next speaker is uh, Kurt de Boeuf, who lives in Cairo, where he is representing the other group. Um, and he is uh, reporting on the uh, post-revolutionary Egypt. Um, thank you. Uh, thank, thank you very much. What am I doing in Cairo? Um, a question many people are asking. <laughs> um, basically, after the revolution uh, in Tunisia and in Egypt, um, we went two times uh, to Cairo. Um, so, uh, Anami was there. Uh, well, I was there with Anami, not the other way around, of course. And um, what we realized is that we Europeans had no clue what was happening in the Arab world. We had no idea. Of course, we were not the only ones who did not see it coming, the revolution. But even more after the revolution, in Tunisia and Egypt and after that uh, in so many countries, we, we, we had no, no idea. I mean, we did not understand what was happening, but not only that, I mean, we didn't know what was happening. And um, nevertheless, it's the southern Mediterranean, or the Eastern Mediterranean, uh, it's our neighbors, it's uh, our sea, and uh, we are discussing it, we are giving money also, we are uh, 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 making decisions about this, uh, this, this, this area, but we had no idea. So that's why the Aldi group decided to send someone, being me, to the area to try to understand what was happening. Um, what did I understood. First of all, my first thing, what I realized is that even living there and even being there in the region for several times is that I didn't understand, again. Um, 
We as Europeans, um, and I think I can speak for uh, the most of us, uh, except of course uh, Arabia and uh, some others, uh, is that we, we do not understand uh, the history of the region. The only thing we know is what happens in ancient history. Uh, we, know also, we all know the pyramids and so forth, but after the pyramids is a black hole. So for us, what happened in the 19th century what have we done there as Europeans uh, in the 19th and the 20th century? Colonization, uh, we divided the countries, uh, we betrayed them several times heavily. We all forgot about this. We know the film of uh, Lawrence of Arabia and that's it. Because the most important reason is because we are afraid of Islam. We think Islam, it stands, it's dangerous. These people are trying to destroy us in a certain way. And it's a religion we do not understand. Um, I had the same feeling. So I studied uh, several years ago, I studied uh, some extremist uh, writers, Egyptian writers, Said Utap, who is, uh, let's say, the evil writer of the Muslim Brotherhood and, 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 and who was, uh, let's say, the master of uh, Osama bin Laden. And this is the thing we are studying. And I changed my mind, I must admit, when I was visiting Lebanon, uh, but I crossed the border and I went to uh, Damascus. I went to Damascus into the Umayyad Mosque. The Umayyad Mosque is built in 745. Very old mosque. Uh, very interesting mosque because it's built, it was built on a church and that church was built on a temple of Jupiter. So all <laughs> typical for a for great uh, building. And when I entered this important mosque, what I saw there, was uh, children playing, families picnicking in the mosque, and a lot of people sleeping. I mean, we can sleep in churches, but you don't sleep, I mean, you sleep hidden, not, not in an open way. So there people just sleep, they pray and so forth, they hide for the sun, and it was so relaxed. And I thought, I mean, everything that happens in the region is just an example. Nothing is what it seems. And it's very hard to understand what is going on because uh, although it's very near, it is a different world. I mean, we are all the same people in the end. So, uh, but the problems right now are, of course, uh, quite, quite big. And um, I think it's absolutely fascinating. And we, as I said again, from a European point of view, we sometimes, we get away because we, this is a wall of Islam and we can't get through this wall and, and, and try to see that these people, in fact, are just wanting to have the same life, more or less, as we want. And I'm very happy to be here at this moment, but also a bit sad because I want to be on the streets in Egypt right now. Um, um, what is happening right now is, 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 is very important. We all know there were revolutions. We all know, like, after revolutions, it were like Islamists taking over, and we think that was that. So all the optimists about the revolution in the Arab world, they were all wrong because now we have an Islamist dictatorship, and they're taking over, and the extremists, and that's it. Well, what is happening in Egypt right now, for example, but not only in Egypt, also in Jordan, also in Bahrain, and Yemen, also in Tunisia, by the way, exactly on this moment, is that people like us, liberals, People who don't want dictatorship, who don't want uh, to be shut up, who don't want uh, a life dictated by others, they're on the streets again. They had two years of struggle, two years of deaths in and around Tahrir. I've, I've seen him passing around me. I mean, a uh, horrible view just one year ago, Mohammed Mahmoud, the famous street next to Tahrir. I mean, ambulances going away every every minute with people wounded, eyes shot out by the police, and so forth. And these people are not tired. No, they're going again right now. I just heard from uh, Mahmoud Salem, you will hear him later, we were together in the car, that last night five people died next to the presidential palace uh, because there were fights with the uh, Muslim Brotherhood. But these people are staying there again thousands, hundreds of thousands, and that gives me a lot of hope. So, um, 
what I learned basically um, after um, my period, which is now almost one and a half year in uh, the Middle East and, and Northern Africa, is that we always thought the Arab world, you know, I mean, uh, it's, it, it's not dating from us, it's dating from the Greek times, I mean, 5th century BC, where Herodotus says, you know, Europe, he means Athens, is democracy, and the East is tyranny, dictatorship. They, don't, they can't handle democracy. Well, I mean, when was the time that we were dying for freedom and democracy? It's a long time ago, uh, more than 60 years. And uh, I see these guys coming on the street all the time. And what I want from Europe, and also from you, I mean, European politicians, young leaders, is that we support these people. Right now, and I, uh, I'm perhaps saying this too much, but uh, we are silent. Europe, I'm not only talking about European Union, but also many countries, many parties, we say, you know, Basically, we don't care what is happening now. People dying, you know, they're always dying there. No, they are fighting for our values, for liberal values. Well, I think that our parties, your parties, that we should perhaps not all go there. I mean, uh, I'm your representative there. You don't have to die there, so uh, I will do it in your place. But, um, <laughs> I mean, support these people. Be interested in what they're doing, what they're fighting for, and try to say, you know, what you're fighting for, we respect, and if you need it, we will support you. Not with money, but just with an intention like, I mean, we like what you're doing, and, uh, and uh, whatever you want us to do, we're going to support you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Last but not least, we have uh, Rabbi, who is uh, the Vice President of IFRI, the in International Liberal Youth, and he's also the International Officer of uh, Future Youth of Lebanon. Thank you for coming. And Thank you. Uh, First, I would like to start by uh, thanking Aldi for inviting me to its Winter Academy in Brussels. It's a great honor to be sitting next to two prominent uh, Belgian politicians, MEP, Anime, uh, who, uh, who was a three-term um, member of the European Parliament and a six-year president of uh, Liberals International. Uh, Mr. Kurt, uh, who was previously in the political kitchen by being the chief cabinet of uh, Prime Minister Guy Verhofstadt, and currently in the front lines of the Arab Spring by being Aldi's representative in Cairo. By the way, he almost uh, got hit by a smoke bomb last week in the streets of Cairo. Uh, well, it's a great honor. Uh, to be sitting here and talking to you guys. Uh, the, role, the, the theme of our panel today is the role of uh, liberals and democrats in the Arab Spring. Uh, well, definitely the Arab liberal powers are having a big role in post the Arab Spring. It's true that Islamists are sweeping uh, power uh, through democracy and uh, through elections, but the Arab uh, liberal powers are sort of creating the balance of power in order not to see those Islamists as, as new tyrannies or new dictatorships. And this is exactly what Kurt just mentioned. This is exactly what's happening right now in the streets of Cairo and in Egypt and even in Tunisia. The people gave, gave time uh, for the new powers who won through democracy and by elections through the Islamic Brotherhood specifically. Uh, they gave them time, but unfortunately, uh, they miscarried uh, their responsibility. And now we see the people and the youth specifically back to the streets once again. Uh, from an economic point of view, the Arab liberal powers are, uh, are a key asset for the new Arab world through a free economy and through uh, uh, new entrepreneurship models, uh, especially in uh, Lebanon, Jordan, and Egypt. Uh, the Arab uh, liberals are playing an important role economically and which definitely affects the EU and all its members. I can give you an example of uh, late Prime Minister Rafi al-Hariri from my country who was assassinated by the Syrian regime. He came with an economic uh, liberal platform uh, and he became one of the biggest uh, political players in the Middle East and in the region. From a social uh, point of view, uh, the Arab liberals should I know they're not doing it right now, but should defend the women's rights more in the Arab world. Uh, I know it's not being as a uh, number one priority because uh, 
their life is in threat now, so they have different priorities. But definitely in the near future, women's rights should be a main priority. Uh, and lately, a couple of uh, liberal organ Arab liberal organizations and NGOs uh, launched uh, a new campaign under the title, The Uprising of Women in the Arab World. And I'll give you a small example where it had, uh, the Facebook page had more than 78,000 likes in less than a month. Uh, the youth who I represent here today by being the international, uh, by being the vice president of IFLERI, uh, for you who doesn't know what's IFLERI, it's the International Federation of Liberal Youth, and I represent the MENA region. The youth were and definitely are uh, the main pillar of uh, all the revolutions that are happening and taking place right now. Uh, of course, how not uh, where, when they present more than 50% of the Arab population. Uh, but unfortunately, the youth, uh, after the revolutions and post the revolutions, have been put on the side, and they are not uh, taking part in the decision making and in the political system that are being built and being established post the revolutions. But definitely, us as youth uh, and as Ifliri and as, as future youth specifically, we're trying to make uh, things change. We recently launched in Beirut. Uh, two weeks ago, and Kurt was there, uh, the Arab Spring Youth Federation, with the help of uh, several European friends from uh, VVD, D66, FNF, and many others. We managed to gather more than 12 uh, liberal youth organizations under one federation from around nine, from nine Arab states uh, in order to have a common platform to share ideas, to share best practices, especially us Lebanese, we have a big role because we were privileged that we had democracy way before they had democracy or they even knew what's elections. So we're trying to share our best practices, we're trying to share our knowledge with them in order to have a, a smooth transitional peri uh, period and process and in order for them to be set up and ready for the upcoming elections. Especially as uh, MEP and enemy said that uh, the Islamic Brotherhood and the Islamist uh, forces, they were way before us, way before the liberal forces. That's why we see them winning elections because they are established, they are organized, they are there and they know what to do. Uh, I know it's a tough job, it's not easy. Uh, like Kurt said, we need your support, uh, not financially. We need your support morally. We're seeing what's happening in Syria right now. And uh, the world is sitting there and watching uh, a butcher and a dictator killing uh, his own people. I know we have, yesterday I was uh, watching one of the panels and someone said that he's afraid that the Syrian revolution will turn into a new Taliban. No, that's not true. The Syrian people are represent the, the revolutionists are representing the Syrian people. The Christians first before the Muslims, because I also heard that the Assad regime is defending and protecting minorities, and that's not even true. That's the propaganda that he's trying to to spread. This regime and all dictatorships, they don't have they know they don't believe in religion, they don't believe in God. The people the person that kills his own people, I don't think he belongs to any religion. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, now the uh, floor is open for questions to anyone from the panel. Hello, my name is Anna uh, from Ukraine. You just told that you say that uh, your belief is uh, he who kills people doesn't have any religion. Well, I agree with this. So my question would be about Egyptian people. So it's again a revolution, and we have like Muslim Brotherhood that now takes majority. And what they do, basically they kill people, especially Coptic uh, nationalist minority, like ethnic minority, and uh, Christian uh, religious minority. And what LD does just now, as I heard yesterday, they're just waiting to people who decided on the, their own like what is good for them. Because if majority wants to be Muslim, even radical Muslims, so we just need to wait and give them this right to do so. So what about minorities? And especially for women, I don't think that they want to be in such oppression. And it was their democratization that they were waiting for. So what's your opinion? And yours also. Yeah, on the minorities, whether in Egypt, whether in Lebanon, whether in Syria. And definitely we condemn uh, all 
the acts that are being done by the Muslim Brotherhood. But I didn't hear any recent events that they are physically killing people. I know that they attack the Copts and they are being uh, oppressed in one way or another. Uh, but I believe by having the people back on the streets and what we're seeing in the past couple of days is a perfect example of what I said. The people will not allow this. The Egyptian people, especially the youth, the Christians and the Muslims, they are down together on the streets right now as we speak in the Tahrir Square and, and saying no to all this and saying no to the Muslim Brotherhood and saying no to Mercy's uh, constitutional amendments. So I believe uh, the people will not allow this, even though we have evil powers uh, maybe coming to power. Uh, but uh, I believe uh, sooner or later uh, the people will uh, say its word and we will have everyone, especially I come from Lebanon, a country that is uh, multicultural, a country that has 18 sects and has more than seven religions. And I, I come from a minority also that, is, that doesn't belong to my party. Uh, I believe that we can create a harmony where everyone could live together and Lebanon is a perfect example. So I don't see why it, it can't happen in Egypt or why it can't happen in Iraq or why it can't happen in, in Syria. I believe uh, dictatorships are still have uh, their arms and their ears and their power in the, in the current political systems and it, it, will, it will take time for the process to move on and it will take time for uh, things to get clear. Uh, your, your second question regarding the women's right, if you could repeat it again, please. They are not gaining their rights, they are losing it for now. So what's, uh, what does LDE do, do with this yeah. point? No, definitely post, like definitely post the Arab Spring, women are not losing their rights. Uh, we saw women in the streets in Tahrir, we saw women in Tunisia, we saw women in Yemen, we saw women in Libya shouting and screaming and uh, asking for their rights. Uh, in terms of uh, political rights maybe, to be more uh, specific, uh, it's true, women's rights, will, it, it will take time. Uh, but we have also a lot of examples in Egypt and in Tunisia where we have uh, women and, and cabinet members and we have them in Libya as well. To be, to be honest, the Islamist ideology uh, is trying to take us back to dictatorship, to new dictatorship. Uh, and this is, what, uh, this is what we are facing as liberal powers in the Arab uh, world. This is the main obstacle that we were facing, that they are not showing the true image. Because as Kurt said, we shouldn't be afraid of Islam. Islam calls for equality. Islam calls for reforms. Uh, we shouldn't be afraid of Islam. But they are showing the wrong image of Islam. And that's why us uh, liberals, whether we, be, we are Christians or Muslims, we are trying to show the real image of the Arab world. <coughs> Thank you. But I understand that there are like different kinds of Islam. It's like radical Islam or it's like moderate Islam. That's, I agree with it. But I think enemy has a comment. Yes, I, I would like to come in at this stage, if, if I may. Uh, I was in Cairo uh, three weeks ago, and uh, together with four other MEPs, and we were present at the launching of the EU-Egypt task force. And in, in, in the course of, of these activities, we had a, a very interesting meeting with five journalists from the written press and from television, uh, four women and one man. And uh, I, I raised the issue of uh, the question whether the constitutional article that says that uh, legislation should be based on uh, or originate from the principles of Sharia on the one hand, and the other constitutional article that uh, says that uh, there should be no discrimination, something like that, how compatible are these? and that we were a little bit worried about it. And, and the women, especially and on, on our side, uh, the, the MEPs were three women and one, two men. And um, so, well, they started to explain uh, yes or no. Uh, the, the, so we, we are in favor of equality. And, and then the, the only male journalist said, yes, 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 but, but still there are principles of Sharia which must be respected. For instance, the fact that the inheritance part of a man is twice as large as what 
uh, a woman can inherit, and, and he added polygamy. The fact that a man can marry four, four women. Uh, and so the other women were, were well, the, the, the women, the other journalists, I mean, were, were smiling and, and uh, but some of them, they, yes, yes, we, 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 we must uh, help uh, mentalities to change and uh, it, it is not going to be easy and uh, we should not be naive in our own societies, we're still not there. Uh, in Belgium, at this moment, there's a whole debate going on because the Flemish Employer Association uh, has convened a congress and all of the speakers are male, for the exception of the moderator, who's a, a young female. And so one woman entrepreneur has publicly protested. And now we have this ongoing debate. But is this important? Well, yes, of course it's important. Uh, so we, we need to assist this process. Maybe not so much by, by saying this is how you should do it, because they must come themselves to uh, the realization and the acceptance of the principle, but by assisting women, supporting them, helping them, uh, by supporting women organizations. Uh, uh, another of my experiences is that uh, when I set up, when I was at Liberal International, Win with women programs and, and women leadership programs all over the world, in, in various parts of the world. Everywhere, the participating women would say, yes, of course, there should be more women in politics, but they should be competent. So one day I got enough. I said, now listen, have you ever heard men saying that, of course, men must participate in politics, provided they are competent. Of course, men are competent. So, uh, we still have a long way to go and we should support one another. This was one of my most moving experiences that is this, sorry gentlemen, but this spontaneous sisterhood which manifests itself in little smiles, a wink here, a wink there, uh, kind of very discreet reaction. Oh God, there they go again. Thank you. More questions? Syria has shot down a Turkish military plane. They have shot at civilians in the Republic of Turkey. And of course, Turkey recently acquired Patriot missiles. Well, is there a threat of the Syrian conflict escalating to a more international level with the United States and the European Union being involved as well? Or um, will it remain on a local civil war level? It will remain local, but um, if that's your fear, so um, I'm happy. I mean, I had a big discussion with a friend of mine uh, two days ago because I, got an in I gave an interview to a, a magazine saying that I'm convinced that it's a good step of NATO by putting Patriot missiles uh, in Turkey. Why? Are these Patriot missiles uh, very important? I mean, very dangerous? No, of course not. Can they reach a long distance? No, they can't. But why are they important? It's the first time in the Syrian conflict, which started on the 15th March 2011, it's the first time that an international organization, being NATO now, takes a decision at all. The first decision. So, and I mean, I'm quite involved in, 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 not involved, of course, I'm not shooting in Syria, but I mean, um, um, it's, it's, it's really, really sad to see that, I mean, he's just killing people. I mean, it's the, it's, it's, it's the only goal now, because he can't win anymore. He knows he can't win, I think. So he's just like destroying, destroying the country. I mean, I think since, since what we have seen in Homs, it's very clear, I mean, it's already one year ago. Uh, uh, it's just destroy, destroy, destroy. And we were sitting, we were giving sanctions and so forth, but we were unable to have a coordinated response. And that, because, of course, Russia was uh, against it and China was a kind of following Russia. But now NATO said, okay, we're going to do something. And uh, the fact that they put missiles there 
as a warning to Assad. And uh, one friend of mine who is uh, well, also very much involved, uh, I'm not going to repeat the words because they were a bit uh, impolite, but uh, was, he panicked. Assad is panicking. We, we can discuss this, but I think it's true. Because if NATO puts missiles there, it means they, they did the first decision. First time. He always thought, you know, I can do whatever I want. Nobody is ever going to intervene in my massacre. Which was true. The only thing we could do was uh, closing bank accounts and, uh, and so forth. And perhaps some oil uh, things here and there. But now, so, something is decided. Whatever happens, if there's a, one plane going just too far, I mean, they're going to shoot him, probably, because uh, the Patriots, they are not very efficient, but uh, it's just the idea. And if things get worse, the first step can lead to a second step, and so forth. And the fact, I can, I'm, I'm following on Twitter uh, some pro-Assad people. It's always interesting to see what the other side is thinking. And uh, for them, the big traitor now is Russia, because Russia did allow NATO to put missiles there. They're not there, of course, yet, but nevertheless. So the big trade was Russia, and they feel more and more isolated. And the fact that everyone is, like, getting organized against them, plus the fact, I mean, we haven't talked really about Syria, but, I mean, uh, uh, um, right now, I think the real control of the regime in Syria concerns Damascus, and five kilometers around Damascus. That's it. Of course, we have other parts, Latakia and so forth, and, and parts. But in general, he lost the control over Syria. We tend to forget this. I mean, I mean I'm, not, I'm a bit exaggerating, but I mean, I mean, the real stronghold is Damascus. And even there, they are attacking the airport. And people are defecting. High-level people, a lot of soldiers, he has not the capability of even taking back Aleppo. He has not the people to do that, because the people don't want to do that. And if I said I have respect for the people in Cairo in the streets, I, have, I mean, my respect is even 10 times higher for those Syrians who are going, even until now, to the streets almost every day, knowing they're going to be shot, killed, massacred. It's amazing. And it's not... The whole story, and, and I want to answer on the, the, the lady's question as well uh, before, this is nothing to do about religion, about minorities and so forth. I mean, who is trying to abuse minorities? It's dictators who are abusing the minorities. Who was bombing the Christian areas in Damascus and, and, and abroad? It was Assad. Same, when were the biggest attacks on the cops in, in Egypt? was not under the Muslim Brotherhood. No, it was under Mubarak when the church was, 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 was exploded. Not by him, of course, but by Gamay Islamiyah. was bombed on Christmas night in 2010. So, I mean, the whole story about, oh, yes, and the Islamists are coming and minorities are threatened and so forth. Well, I'm convinced that right now, certainly in Egypt, but also in the future in Syria, minorities, I mean, it's going to be nasty when Assad falls for, for a while. And the Alawites will suffer, I'm sure about that. But in general, it's going to be a lot better than under the dictatorship we have seen today. Europe did not see the Arab Spring coming. That we did not expect it to happen. And my question is, how can this be? Did Europe just discover this, uh, these countries, these territories? Do we not have diplomatic relations with them for a long, long time now? Do we not have intelligence services anymore? How come we were uh, amazed that this is happening? And how come we didn't know what the people in these countries actually feel and they want? Thank you. Who would like to answer that? Um, yesterday I heard also a nice story of, uh, of uh, Edward who said that uh, just after the French Revolution, they asked the Chinese uh, emperor, what do you think of the French Revolution? I said, too early to call. So uh, I said, it's too early to tell. So, uh, I mean, a revolution, you always hope it's going to happen. But when it happens, you're always surprised. I mean, uh, 
if we could if we could have predicted, also Mubarak and Ben Ali and Assad could have predicted. I still remember just after Egyptian Revolution that Assad said it's never going to happen in Syria. And I think 99.9% .9 of the world believed him. And even a majority of the Syrians believed him. So, I mean, I think you never can really protect, predict a revolution. So that's a nice thing about it. It's just, it happens, kaboom. I mean, so many people, I mean, I'm now talking about Egypt, so many people, when they heard the 25th of January, they're going to Tahrir. Al Aswani, I mean, the famous writer, he, he, he told me, he was sitting at home, he said, yeah, 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 another little thing on Tahrir Square. I'm just, and then he was sitting, watching TV, and he said, oh my God, they're really on Tahrir Square. I go. So, the Egyptians were surprised as well. So, uh, so yes, we have intelligence, but all intelligence is not enough to uh, predict revolutions in this world. Hi, my name is Anne-Marie, I'm from Bucharest. Uh, my question is for uh, all three of you, um, because uh, it was said that um, the European Union or the Liberals in the European Union uh, did not do much uh, for, for the Syrian revolution. My question is, what could we have done and what, what could we do now? What do you think uh, the solution would be for the situation in Syria? Thank you very much. Uh, I, I'm not a, really a specialist in, in, in defense matters, but uh, um, the Syrian uh, uprising and, and the reaction by Assad uh, occurred shortly after the intervention in Libya. Uh, when when in, in Libya it appeared that uh, the Gaddafi forces or whatever remained of the Gaddafi forces were about to massacre the population of Benghazi. And that is when uh, an, uh, an international intervention was decided. There was a United uh, Nations Security Council resolution saying that uh, for humanitarian reasons, uh, uh, first uh, there had to be an... Uh, uh, the sky had to be closed, so a no-fly zone over Libya, and uh, stopping or preventing the massacre. Uh, and, and you know what happened afterwards. Uh, uh, there was a military intervention, and it ended with uh, the toppling of the regime and, and uh, the death of, of Gaddafi. And on the one hand, uh, some permanent members of the Security Council, in this case Russia and China especially, uh, found, according to them, that the international forces and in NATO that intervened in Libya overstepped the Security Council mandate. And that regime change had never been the objective, although one could have known that if you wanted to stop Gaddafi, there was probably only one way to stop him, and that is to do away with him, to say it crudely. And this explains to a degree uh, the extreme reluctance of China and Russia to allow uh, an, 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 an operation in Syria. Because it's, they probably think, okay, if, if we allow this in Syria, then where will they stop? And maybe one day they will want, uh, the rest of the world will want to change uh, the Russian regime and the Chinese regime, and, and we can't possibly allow this. So this is one side of the story. Another side is, but there, the two gentlemen next to me who are familiar with the terrain are much better placed than I am, is that Syria offers a totally different terrain than Libya. Libya, for large part, is desert, with a number of towns. Uh, so, intervention was relatively easy, while what people say is that uh, the terrain in Syria is much more complicated, much more difficult, much more densely populated. Uh, at the beginning, it looked like uh, the Syrian army was much stronger, 
than, than the Libyan better uh, equipped uh, air defense capabilities, etc., etc. I don't know to what degree uh, these reasons are, are, are valid, but in any case, uh, Western uh, nations or governments uh, and parliaments uh, have thought that uh, they didn't want to intervene physically and they didn't want to send their own uh, young people in, in one more war. There are those who participated in uh, the second Iraq war, we did not, my country, uh, Afghanistan, where we still have soldiers, uh, I mean, as a country. Uh, okay, how many more? And, and I sometimes feel that we must, as Europeans or Westerners, and, and I stand to be challenged by any of you, of course, uh, with what I'm going to say, we must be wary of, let, of letting the rest of the world believe that we are willing able and ready to intervene anywhere in the world whenever people start fighting. Well, we are not willing to do that. We are certainly unable to do that. Even the United States have problems uh, in, in managing two uh, large-scale operations uh, out of theater, as they say. So we should, we must be wary to allow people to believe that uh, if they start something, we will come in immediately uh, and help them. Uh, that uh, because we are not going to do it. I'm sorry, it's not a nice message, but, uh, but please. Continuing from uh, uh, MP's point of view, I think uh, Libya has oil, Syria doesn't. I think uh, Libya is in the middle of the desert and Syria has Israel as a neighbor. I think those two main points are uh, crucial in this uh, aspect. It's not true that the liberal forces in the EU and ALDI specifically didn't support uh, or could have supported more because I remember a statement almost a year ago in Barcelona by uh, Prime Minister Guy uh, where he said that he called for military intervention in Syria and he called for a no-fly zone. This is from a long time ago. But EU, and, and as, 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 as an entity, I think economic, uh, uh, economic decisions are not enough. Uh, we should call for a military intervention. And the biggest disappointment is definitely the US. Uh, because we always saw the US uh, defending, or asking, or claiming that they defend human rights, and. We saw how they interfered in Afghanistan and how they interfered in Iraq because they suspected that Saddam Hussein might have nuclear weapons and might kill and might uh, kill his own people. Where we saw its uh, decision in Syria was a total uh, disappointment. And it's more disappointing for a normal Arab citizen to hear on the news, yeah, after the US presidential elections, uh, things will change, or after Obama appoints his uh, Secretary of State, things will change, where if we see people dying day after day in the streets, and we are waiting for an election, or we're waiting for someone to be appointed. Uh, I think the international community should uh, play a bigger role. I know politics is all about interests, uh, but uh, we came to a point where it's uh, human... Uh, uh, souls and human dignity is at stake. So I call you as uh, Europeans to put more pressure on your organizations uh, to push for that and to have uh, things move uh, quicker and faster in this regard. Uh, but, but to, to, also to answer the question, what can we do now? I mean, concretely, I think we can do two things, two important things. One is there is a new coalition, an opposition coalition uh, led by... Uh, Muaz Khatib, so the former imam of uh, the Umayyad Mosque, the one I loved. Uh, I mean, we don't recognize this coalition yet. It's a mistake. We have to recognize them, because by recognizing them, I mean, you make Assad weaker. So we say we recognize a unified opposition, and you make the opposition stronger. Secondly,
by recognizing these guys, who are the moderate guys, by the way, Muslim Brotherhood has a, uh, right now a minority in this coalition, you also make the, what you, I heard someone, the Taliban or whatever, I mean, the more uh, jihadis who are also in Syria, you make these guys weaker, so politically. Secondly, what do we need? Well, what do they need? Uh, well, I always say we, uh, bullets. Very simple. I mean, uh, what is the problem with the so-called extremists in Syria? They're not many, don't exaggerate it, but they are there. And they are stronger than the others. Why? Because they get the right weapons, while the others don't. So if I'm a Syrian citizen, I mean, and I want protection, who will I ask? The guys I like, but who are not weaponed? Or the guys I don't like, but who are, have the right weapons? Of course, I go to the right weapons. I would say, you know, I mean, and if they ask me, they give me $10, and this is reality, they give me $10, to put their message on a paper, to take a picture and to send it to Al Arabiya, I'll do it, no problem. Then I have some food. So that's the problem that the, let's say, between brackets, the secular opposition or the non extremist opposition, the FSA, they don't get our support. If they have enough bullets right now, they can make an offensive, they can liberate Aleppo. They can. But right now, they don't have enough weapons. And to me, I'm be, I, it makes me mad. So uh, it's very simple. Just send some bullets and recognize the new coalition. That's all we have to do. Thank you. Any more questions? Yes, please. Good morning. I'm Teppo from Finland. Uh, Mr. Mingarelli from External Action told us yesterday that after the revolutions and ongoing revolutions, unemployment is on the rise. There are a lot of young people without jobs and uh, foreign investment, investments are withdrawn because of um, instability. So people were fighting for freedom, for values, and still are doing that. But do you think that if everyday life does not improve, people would be disillusioned, disappointed with democracy, even though that there would be liberal governments? Yeah, obviously, and, and there, uh, again, one uh, can only make the analogy with, with, with some evolutions that have taken place in, in uh, formerly communist countries, uh, where you had enthusiasm after the people liberated themselves in the late 1980s and early 1990s. Uh, but democracy by itself does not bring economic development. You, you need uh, much more, you need investment and uh, uh, one thing w which I find sad to watch is uh, that you see that uh, Western tourism uh, has vir virtually come to a stop to the entire region, uh, making absolutely no distinction between uh, countries where things are, are quiet and, and calm and, and others which are in, in, in turmoil. They, they simply stay away. Uh, while the, the economies of those countries depend uh, for a, a, a significant percentage on income from tourism and the tourism industry. And then you have the investments. Uh, and uh, so one part of uh, the EU Egypt task force was to bring several hundred business uh, people to Egypt. Uh, including representatives from small and medium enterprises, and, and that was a, a, a successful uh, meeting. But of course, we, what's happening now, and, and the decree of Morsi, and, and the reaction to that, and, and the uncertainty concerning the, the, the constitution and everything, uh, those decisions uh, on investments might be delayed while the employment, unemployment figures are absolutely staggering. And, and they are staggering uh, because these are um, societies where um, vested interests are all powerful. Uh, whether these are vested interests of people uh, uh, high officers of the army, like in Egypt, where the army is, is probably one of the main uh, 
economic uh, powers, even if it's more or less hidden. Or else you have other forms of vested interests which effectively make uh, fair competition very, very difficult. And that means that to start up a, a business, even a small business, even if a small in a small city, uh, if that is going to be seen as competition by one of the established businesses, it's going to be very difficult. Which, by the way, was more or less the, the, the trigger in Tunisia, where this young man who was selling fruits on the st street of a small city was being blackmailed uh, by, by, by the local police. And then he set fire to himself uh, and, and that triggered the, the everything. But this is because these kind of things happen too often uh, all the time. Um, I, I remember that, that a few years after the so-called Velvet Revolution in the Czech Republic, uh, Václav Havel, who was newly elected president, said in his New Year's speech, which was a remarkable speech, and he called upon the Czech people and he said, we should all ask ourselves, why have we allowed this to go on for so long? I mean, Revolutions are fantastic, but, but uh, they are unpredictable by nature, always, all of them. Uh, and it's something we, we, we should know. And it's important to foster openness in societies, exchange, debate, so that uh, there are outlets for energy, pent-up energy, creativity, uh, etc.